Track 27. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley. Of BigBible.org. Track 27. The Third Epoch. 5. The story of my first inquiries in Hampshire is soon told. My early departure from London enabled me to reach Mr. Dawson's house in the forenoon. Our interview, so far as the object of my visit was concerned, led to no satisfactory result. Mr. Dawson's book certainly showed when he had resumed his attendance on Miss Halcombe at Blackwater Park, but it was not possible to calculate back from this date with any exactness. Without such help from Mrs. Michelson, as I knew she was unable to afford. She could not say from memory, who in similar case ever can, how many days had elapsed between the renewal of the doctor's attendance on his patient and the previous departure of Lady Glyde. She was almost certain of having mentioned the circumstance of the departure to Miss Halcombe on the day after it happened, but then she was no more able to fix the date of the day on which this disclosure took place than to fix the date of the day before, when Lady Glyde had left for London. Neither could she calculate, with any nearer approach to exactness, the period when the updated letter from Madame Fosco arrived. Lastly, as if to complete the series of difficulties, the doctor himself, having been ill at the time, had omitted to make his usual entry for the day of the week and month when the gardener from Blackwater Park had called him to deliver Mrs. Michelson's message. Hopeless of obtaining assistance from Mr. Dawson, I resolved to try next, if I could establish the date of Sir Percival's arrival at Knowlesbury. It seemed like a fatality. When I reached Knowlesbury, the inn was shut up, and bills were posted on the walls. The speculation had been a bad one, as I was informed, ever since the time of the railway. The new hotel at the station had gradually absorbed the business, and the old inn, which we knew to be the inn at which Sir Percival had put up, had been closed about two months since. The proprietor had left town with all his goods and chattels, and where he had gone I could not positively ascertain from any one. The four people of whom I inquired gave me four different accounts of his plans and projects when he left Knowlesbury. There were still some hours to spare before the last train left for London and I drove back again in the fly from the Knowlesbury station to Blackwater Park, with the purpose of questioning the gardener and the person who kept the lodge. If they too proved unable to assist me, my resources for the present were at an end, and I might return to town. I dismissed the fly a mile distant from the park, and getting my directions from the driver, proceeded by myself to the house. As I turned into the lane from the high road, I saw a man with a carpet-bag, walking before me rapidly on the way to the lodge. He was a little man, dressed in shabby black, and wearing a remarkably large hat. I set him down, as well as it was possible to judge, for a lawyer's clerk, and stopped at once to widen the distance between us. He had not heard me, and he walked on out of sight, without looking back. When I passed through the gates myself, a little while afterwards, he was not visible. He had evidently gone on to the house. There were two women in the lodge. One of them was old. The other I knew at once, by Marian's description of her, to be Margaret Porcher. I asked first if Sir Percival was at the park, and, receiving a reply in the negative, inquired next when he had left it. Neither of the women could tell me more than that he had gone away in the summer. I could extract nothing from Margaret Porcher but vacant smiles and shakings of the head. The old woman was a little more intelligent, and I managed to lead her into speaking of the manner of Sir Percival's departure, and of the alarm it had caused her. She remembered her master calling her out of bed, and remembered his frightening her by swearing. But the date at which the occurrence happened was, as she honestly acknowledged, quite beyond her. On leaving the lodge I saw the gardener at work not far off. When I first addressed him, he looked at me rather distrustfully, but on my using Mrs. Michelson's name, with a civil reference to himself, he entered into conversation readily enough. There is no need to describe what passed between us. It ended, as all my other attempts to discover the date had ended, 
The gardener knew that his master had driven away, at night, sometime in July, the last fortnight, or the last ten days of the month, but knew no more. While we were speaking together, I saw the man in black, with the large hat, come out from the house, and stand at some little distance, observing us. Certain suspicions of his errand at Blackwater Park had already crossed my mind. They were now increased by the gardener's inability or unwillingness to tell me who the man was, and I determined to clear the way before me, if possible, by speaking to him. The plainest question I could put as a stranger would be to inquire if the house was allowed to be shown to visitors. I walked up to the man at once, and accosted him in those words. His look and manner unmistakably betrayed that he knew who I was, and that he wanted to irritate me into quarrelling with him. His reply was insolent enough to have answered the purpose if I had been less determined to control myself. As it was, I met him with the most resolute politeness, apologised for my involuntary intrusion, which he called a trespass, and left the grounds. It was exactly as I suspected. The recognition of me when I left Mr. Kyle's office had evidently been communicated to Sir Percival Glyde, and the man in black had been sent to the park in anticipation of my making inquiries at the house or in the neighbourhood. If I had given him the least chance of lodging any sort of legal complaint against me, the interference of the local magistrate would no doubt have been turned to account as a cog on the proceedings, and a means of separating me from Marian and Laura for some days at least. I was prepared to be watched on the way back from Blackwater Park to the station, exactly as I had been watched in London the day before. But I could not discover at the time whether I was really fo followed on this occasion or not. The man in black might have had the means of tracking me at his disposal, of which I was not aware, but I certainly saw nothing of him, in his own person, either on the way to the station, or afterward on my arrival at the London terminus in the evening. I reached home on foot, taking the precaution, before I approached our own door, of walking round by the loneliest street in the neighbourhood, and there stopping and looking back more than once over the open space behind me. I had first learnt to use this stratagem against suspected treachery in the wilds of Central America, and now I was practising it again, with the same purpose, and with even greater caution, in the heart of civilised London. Nothing had happened to alarm Marian during my absence. She asked eagerly what success I had met with, and I told her she could not conceal her surprise at the indifference with which I spoke of the failure of my investigations thus far. The truth was that the ill success of my inquiries had in no sense daunted me. I had pursued them as a matter of duty, and I had expected nothing from them. In the state of my mind at that time it was almost a relief to me to know that the struggle was now narrowed to a trial of strength between myself and Sir Percival Glyde. The vindictive motive had mingled itself all along with my other and better motives, and I confess it was a satisfaction to me to feel that the surest way, the only way left, of serving Laura's cause, was to fasten my hold firmly on the villain who had married her. While I acknowledged that I was not strong enough to keep my motives above the reach of this instinct of revenge, I can honestly say something in my own favour on the other side. No base speculation on the future relations of Laura and myself, and on the private and personal concessions which I might force from Sir Percival, if I once had him at my mercy, ever entered my mind. I never said to myself, If I do succeed, it shall be one result of my success, that I put it out of her husband's power to take her from me again. I could not look at her, and think of the future with such thoughts as those. The sad sight of the change from her former self made the one interest of my love an interest of tenderness and compassion, which her father or her brother might have felt, and which I felt, God knows, in my inmost heart. All my hopes looked no further on now than to the day of her recovery. There till she was strong again and happy again, there till she could look at me as she had once looked, and speak to me as she had once spoken, the future of my happiest thought and my dearest wishes ended. These words are written under no prompting of idle self-contemplation. Passages in this narrative are soon to come 
which will set the minds of others in judgment on my conduct. It is right that the best and the worst of me should be fairly balanced before that time. On the morning after my return from Hampshire, I took Marian upstairs to my working-room, and there laid before her the plan which I had matured thus far, for mastering the one assailable point in the life of Sir Percival Glyde. The way to the secret lay through the mystery, hitherto impenetrable to all of us, of the woman in white. The approach to that in its turn might be gained by obtaining the assistance of Anne Catherick's mother, and the only ascertainable means of prevailing on Mrs. Catherick to act or to speak in the matter depended on the chance of my discovering local particulars and family particulars, first of all from Mrs. Clements. After thinking the subject over carefully, I felt certain that I could only begin the new inquiries by placing myself in communication with the faithful friend and protectress of Anne Catherick. The first difficulty, then, was to find Mrs. Clements. I was indebted to Marian's quick perception for meeting this necessity at once, by the best and simplest means. She proposed to write to the farm near Limeridge, Todd's Corner, to inquire whether Mrs. Clements had communicated with Mrs. Todd during the past few months. How Mrs. Clements had been separated from Anne, it was impossible for us to say, but that separation once effected it would certainly have occurred to Mrs. Clements to inquire after the missing woman in the neighbourhood of all others to which she was known to be most attached, the neighbourhood of Limeridge. I saw directly that Marion's proposal offered us the prospect of success, and she wrote to Mrs. Todd accordingly, by that day's post. While we were waiting for the reply, I made myself master of all the information Marion could afford on the subject of Sir Percival's family, and of his early life. She could only speak on these topics from hearsay, but she was reasonably certain of the truth of what little she had to tell. Sir Percival was an only child. His father, Sir Felix Glyde, had suffered from his birth under a painful and incurable deformity, and had shunned all society from his earliest years. His sole happiness was the enjoyment of music, and he had married a lady with tastes similar to his own, who was said to be a most accomplished musician. He inherited the Blackwater property while still a young man. Neither he nor his wife, after taking possession, made advances of any sort towards the society of the neighbourhood, and no one endeavoured to tempt them into abandoning their reserve, with the one disastrous exception of the rector of the parish. The rector was the worst of all innocent mischief-makers, and over-zealous man. He'd heard that Sir Felix left college with the character of being little better than a revolutionist in politics and an infidel in religion, and he arrived conscientiously at the conclusion that it was his bounden duty to summon the lord of the manor to hear sound views enunciated in the parish church. Sir Felix fiercely resented the clergyman's well-meant but ill-directed interference, insulting him so grossly and so publicly that the families in the neighbourhood sent letters of indignant remonstrance to the park, and even the tenants of the Blackwater property expressed their opinion as strongly as they dared. The baronet, who had no country tastes of any kind, and no attachment to the estate or to any one living on it, declared that society at Blackwater should never have a second chance of annoying him, and left the place from that moment. After a short residence in London, he and his wife departed for the continent, and never returned to England again. They lived part of the time in France and part in Germany, always keeping themselves in the strict retirement which the morbid sense of his own personal deformity had made necessary to Sir Felix. Their son Percival had been born abroad, and had been educated there by private tutors. His mother was the first of his parents whom he lost. His father had died a few years after her, either in 1825 or 26. Sir Percival had been in England as a young man, once or twice before that period, but his acquaintance with the late Mr. Fairley did not begin till after the time of his father's death. They soon became very intimate, although Sir Percival was seldom or never at Limeridge House in those days. Mr. Frederick Fairley might have met him once or twice, in Mr. Philip Fairley's company but he could have known little of him at that or at any other time. 
Sir Percival's only intimate friend in the Fairley family had been Laura's father. These were all the particulars that I could gain from Marian. They suggested nothing which was useful to my present purpose, but I noted them down carefully in the event of their proving to be of importance at any future period. Mrs. Todd's reply, addressed by our own wish to the post office at some distance from us, had arrived at its destination when I went to apply for it. The chances which had been all against us hitherto turned from this moment in our favour. Mrs. Todd's letter contained the first item of information of which we were in search. Mrs. Clements, it appeared, had, as we had conjectured, written to Todd's corner, asking pardon, in the first place, for the abrupt manner in which she and Anne had left their friends at the farmhouse on the morning after I had met the woman in white in the Limeridge churchyard, and then informing Mrs. Todd of Anne's disappearance, and entreating that she would cause inquiries to be made in the neighbourhood, on the chance that the lost woman might have strayed back to Limeridge. In making this request, Mrs. Clements had been careful to add to it the address at which she might always be heard of, and that address Mrs. Todd now transmitted to Marian. It was in London, and within half an hour's walk of our own lodging. In the words of the proverb, I resolved not to let the grass grow under my feet. The next morning I set forth to seek an interview with Mrs. Clements. This was my first step forward in the investigation, the story of the desperate attempt to which I now stood committed, begins here. 6. The address communicated by Mrs. Todd took me to a lodging-house situated in a respectable street near the Gray's Inn Road. When I knocked, the door was opened by Mrs. Clements herself. She did not appear to remember me, and asked what my business was. I recalled to her our meeting in Limeridge Churchyard at the close of my interview there with the woman in white, taking special care to remind her that I was the person who assisted Anne Catherick, as Anne herself declared, to escape the pursuit from the asylum. This was my only claim to the confidence of Mrs. Clements. She remembered the circumstances the moment I spoke of it, and asked me into the parlour, in the greatest anxiety to know if I had brought her any news of Anne. It was impossible for me to tell her the whole truth without at the same time entering into particulars on the subject of the conspiracy which it would have been dangerous to confide to a stranger. I could only abstain most carefully from raising any false hopes, and then explain that the object of my visit was to discover the persons who were really responsible for Anne's disappearance. I even added, so as to exonerate myself from any after-reproach of my own conscience, that I entertained not the least hope of being able to trace her, that I believed we should never see her alive again, and that my main interest in the affair was to bring to punishment two men whom I suspected to be concerned in luring her away, and at whose hands I and some dear friends of mine had suffered a grievous wrong. With this explanation I left it to Mrs. Clements to say whether our interest in the matter whatever difference there might be in the motives which actuated us, was not the same, and whether she felt any reluctance to forward my object by giving me such information on the subject of my inquiries as she happened to possess. The poor woman was at first too much confused and agitated to understand thoroughly what I said to her. She could only reply that I was welcome to anything she could tell me in return for the kindness that I had shown to Anne but as she was not very quick and ready at the best of times in talking to strangers, she would beg me to put her in the right way, and to say where I wished her to begin. Knowing by experience that the plainest narrative attainable from persons who are not accustomed to arrange their ideas is the narrative which goes far enough back at the beginning to avoid all impediments of retrospection in its course, I asked Mrs. Clements to tell me first what had happened after she had left Limeridge, and so, by watchful questioning, carried her on from point to point till we reached the period of Anne's disappearance. The substance of the information which I obtained thus was as follows. On leaving the farm at Todd's Corner, Mrs. Clements and Anne had travelled that day as far as Derby, and had remained there a week on Anne's account. They had then gone to London, 
and had lived in the lodging occupied by Mrs. Clements at that time, for a month or more, when circumstances connected with the house and the landlord had obliged them to change their quarters. Anne's terror of being discovered in London or its neighbourhood, whenever they ventured to walk out, had gradually communicated itself to Mrs. Clements, and she had determined on removing to one of the most out-of-the-way places in England, to the town of Grimsby in Lincolnshire, where her deceased husband had passed all his early life. His relatives were respectable people settled in the town. They had always treated Mrs. Clements with great kindness, and she thought it impossible to do better than go there and take the advice of her husband's friends. Anne would not hear of returning to her mother in Welmingham, because she had been removed to the asylum from that place, and because Sir Percival would be certain to go back there and find her again. There was serious weight in the subjection, and Mrs. Clements felt that it was not to be easily removed. At Grimsby the first serious symptoms of illness had shown themselves in Anne. They appeared soon after the news of Lady Glyde's marriage had been made public in the newspapers, and reached her through that medium. The medical man who was sent for to attend the sick woman discovered at once that she was suffering from a serious affection of the heart. The illness lasted long, left her very weak, and returned at intervals, though with mitigated severity, again and again. They remained at Grimsby in consequence during the first half of the new year, and there they might probably have stayed much longer, but for the sudden resolution which Anne took at this time to venture back to Hampshire for the purpose of obtaining a private interview with Lady Glyde. Mrs. Clements did all in her power to oppose the execution of this hazardous and unaccountable project. No explanation of her motives was offered by Anne, except that she believed the day of her death was not far off, and that she had something in her mind which must be communicated to Lady Glyde, at any risk, in secret. Her resolution to accomplish this purpose was so firmly settled that she declared her intention of going to Hampshire by herself if Mrs. Clements felt any unwillingness to go with her. The doctor, on being consulted, was of the opinion that serious opposition to her wishes would in all probability produce another and perhaps a fatal fit of illness, and Mrs. Clements, under this advice, yielded to necessity, and once more, with sad forebodings of trouble and danger to come, allowed Anne Catherick to have her own way. On the journey from London to Hampshire, Mrs. Clements discovered that one of their fellow passengers was well acquainted with the neighbourhood of Blackwater, and could give her all the information she needed on the subject of localities. In this way she found out that the only place they could go to which was not dangerously near to Sir Percival's residence was a large village called Sandon. The distance here from Blackwater Park was between three and four miles, and that distance and back again Anne had walked on each occasion when she had appeared in the neighbourhood of the lake. For the few days during which they were at Sandon without being discovered, they had lived a little way from the village, in the cottage of a decent widow woman, who had a bedroom to let, and whose discreet silence Mrs. Clements had done her best to secure, for the first week at least. She had also tried hard to induce Anne to be content with writing to Lady Glyde, in the first instance, but the failure of the warning contained in the anonymous letter sent to Limeridge had made Anne resolute to speak this time, and obstinate in the determination to go on her errand alone. Mrs. Clements, nevertheless, followed her privately on each occasion when she went to the lake, without, however, venturing near enough to the boat-house to be witness of what took place there. When Anne returned for the last time from the dangerous neighbourhood, the fatigue of walking day after day, distances which were far too great for her strength, added to the exhausting effect of the agitation from which she had suffered, produced the result which Mrs. Clements had dreaded all along. The old pain over the heart and the other symptoms of the illness at Grimsby returned, and Anne was confined to her bed in the cottage. In this emergency the first necessity, as Mrs. Clements knew by experience, was to endeavour to quiet Anne's anxiety of mind, and for this purpose the good woman went herself next day to the lake, to try if she could find Lady Glyde, who would be sure, as Anne said, 
to take her daily walk to the boathouse, and prevail on her to come back privately to the cottage near Sandon. On reaching the outskirts of the plantation, Mrs. Clemens encountered not Lady Glyde, but a tall, stout, elderly gentleman with a book in his hands. In other words, Count Fosco. The Count, after looking at her very attentively for a moment, asked if she expected to see any one in the, that place, and added, before she could reply, that he was waiting there with a message from Lady Glyde, but that he was not certain whether the person then before him answered the description of the person with whom he was desired to communicate. Upon this, Mrs. Clements at once confided her errand to him, and entreated that he would help to allay Anne's anxiety by trusting his message to her. The Count most readily and kindly complied with her request. The message, he said, was a very important one. Lady Glyde entreated Anne and her good friend to return immediately to London, as she felt certain that Sir Percival would discover them if they remained any longer in the neighbourhood of Blackwater. She was herself going to London in a short time, and if Mrs. Clements and Anne would go there first, and would let her know what their address was, they should hear from her and see her in a fortnight or less. The Count added that he had already attempted to give a friendly warning to Anne herself, but that she had been much too startled by seeing that he was a stranger to let him approach and speak to her. To this Mrs. Clements replied, in the greatest alarm and distress, that she asked nothing better than to take Anne safely to London, but that there was no present hope of removing her from the dangerous neighbourhood as she lay ill in her bed at that moment. The Count inquired if Mrs. Clements had sent for medical advice, and hearing that she had hitherto hesitated to do so, from the fear of making their position publicly known in the village, informed her that he was himself a medical man, and that he would go back with her if she pleased, and see what could be done for Anne. Mrs. Clements, feeling a natural confidence in the Count, as a person trusted with a secret message from Lady Glyde, gratefully accepted the offer, and they went back together to the cottage. Anne was asleep when they got there. The Count started at the sight of her, evidently from astonishment at her resemblance to Lady Glyde. Poor Mrs. Clements supposed that he was only shocked to see how ill she was. He would not allow her to be awakened. He was contented with putting questions to Mrs. Clements about her symptoms, with looking at her, and with lightly touching her pulse. Sandon was a large enough place to have a grocer's and druggist's shop in it, and thither the Count went to write his prescription and to get the medicines made up. He brought it back himself, and told Mrs. Clements that the medicine was a powerful stimulant, and that it would certainly give Anne strength to get up and bear the fatigue of the journey to London of only a few hours. The remedy was to be administered at stated times on that day and the day after. On the third day she would be well enough to travel, and he arranged to meet Mrs. Clements at the Blackwater station, and to see them off by the midday train. If they did not appear, he would assume that Anne was worse, and would proceed at once to the cottage. As events turned out, no such emergency as this occurred. This medicine had an extraordinary effect on Anne, and the good results of it were helped by the assurance Mrs. Clements could now give her that she would soon see Lady Glyde in London. At the appointed day and time, when they had not been quite so long as a week in Hampshire altogether, they arrived at the station. The Count was waiting there for them, and was talking to an elderly lady, who appeared to be going to travel by the train to London also. He most kindly assisted them, and put them into the carriage himself, begging Mrs. Clements not to forget to send her address to Lady Glyde. The elderly lady did not travel in the same compartment, and they did not notice what became of her on reaching the London terminus. Mrs. Clements secured respectable lodgings in a quiet neighbourhood, and then wrote as she had engaged to do, to inform Lady Glyde of the address. A little more than a fortnight passed, and no answer came. At the end of that time a lady, the same elderly lady whom they had last seen at the station, called in a cab and said that she came from Lady Glyde, who was then in an hotel in London, and who wished to see Mrs. Clements for the purpose of arranging a future interview with Anne. Mrs. Clements expressed her willingness, and being present at the time, and entreating her to do so, to forward the object in view. 
especially as she was not required to be away from the house for more than half an hour at the most. She and the elderly lady, clearly Madame Fosco, then left in the cab. The lady stopped the cab after it had driven some distance at a shop before they got to the hotel, and begged Mrs. Clements to wait for her for a few minutes while she made a purchase that had been forgotten. She never appeared again. After waiting some time, Mrs. Clements became alarmed, and ordered the cabman to drive back to her lodgings. When she got there, after an absence of rather more than half an hour, Anne was gone. The only information to be obtained from the people of the house was derived from the servant who waited on the lodgers. She had opened the door to a boy from the street, who had left a letter for the young woman who lived on the second floor, the part of the house which Mrs. Clements occupied. The servant had delivered the letter, had then gone downstairs, and five minutes afterwards had observed Anne open the front door and go out, dressed in her bonnet and shawl. She had probably taken the letter with her, for it was not to be found, and it was therefore impossible to tell what inducement had been offered to make her leave the house. It must have been a strong one, for she would never stir out alone in London of her own accord. If Mrs. Clements had not known this by experience, nothing would have induced her to go away in the cab, even for so short a time as half an hour only. As soon as she could collect her thoughts, the first idea that naturally occurred to Mrs. Clements was to go and make inquiries at the asylum, to which she dreaded that Anne had been taken back. She went there the next day, having been informed of the locality in which the house was situated by Anne herself. The answer she received, her application having in all probability been made a day or two before the false Anne Catherick had really been consigned to the safe keeping of the asylum, was that no such person had been brought back there. She had then written to Mrs. Catherick in Wilmington to know if she had seen or heard anything of her daughter, and had received an answer in the negative. After that reply had reached her, she was at the end of her resources, and perfectly ignorant where else to inquire or what else to do. From that time to this, she had remained in total ignorance of the cause of Anne's disappearance, and of the end of Anne's story. End of Track 27